I used to work on the north slope of Alaska in the oil industry. The work we were doing required us to travel far out into the Alaska Petroleum Reserve, which is basically just untamed tundra wilderness for hundreds of miles. The oil companies would build these long ice roads in the winter that would lead to exploration drilling pads. Our job was to go out after they finished the initial drilling and test rock formations for their oil producing qualities. It was mid-January, the sun hadn't quite come up yet, and when I say the sun hadn't come up, I mean in almost a month and a half. Polar nights are intense. The particular well site we were traveling to was about 60 miles west of Alpine, Alaska, deep in the wilderness. Our job took a week, but we finished and were headed back to camp to finish our hitch and go home. At the beginning and end of the ice roads are guard shacks that you have to check in and out for safety. If you don't check in or out in a set time, they come looking for you to ensure you're not a popsicle. It was about 4 in the morning, not that it mattered in the land of endless night, and we were halfway across the ice road. Travel was slow as the speed limits on the road is only 25 miles per hour, when something appeared on the road in our headlights. It was a man, in jeans, sneakers, and a hoodie jacket, walking down an ice road in the wilderness tundra at 4 a.m., and it was negative 20 degrees outside. It's not unusual for the local Inuit people to be out this far hunting. Maybe his snowmobile broke down and he's trying to get back to the guard shack? Seemed plausible. He didn't acknowledge us as our trucks rolled up next to him. He just kept shuffling forward. He didn't seem cold. His clothing, while totally not appropriate for this extreme weather, appeared warm and dry. We also noticed he wasn't Inuit, but Caucasian. I rolled down my window and asked if he needed any help and if he was okay. He didn't acknowledge us, just kept shuffling forward. His face was completely blank, devoid of any thought or emotions. The other guys in my truck suggested that maybe he was in an accident and in shock. I continued rolling my truck alongside him as he trudged down the road, still trying to get his attention. Even in this extreme cold, I could occasionally get whiffs of a peculiar smell coming off of him. He smelled acidic, if that makes any sense. There was just a lot about this guy that made the hair on my neck stand up. The guy behind me in the truck's crew cab had enough of all of this. He rolled down his window and reached out to grab the guy. He later said he was just going to try and shake him out of his stupor. Before my buddy's hand could reach him though, this walking popsicle spun around and latched onto my buddy's outstretched arm. He glared at my buddy and then at me with this look of pure rage, not removing his hand from his arm. His emotions had a physical temperature. This guy could have melted the entire tundra that night. My buddy groaned in pain as he tried to get his arm free from Mr. Popsicle. At that moment, this guy starts screaming in our faces. There was just so much hate and rage and anger in that scream. It was absolutely terrifying. I slammed on the gas and spun out on this ice for a second before the wheels caught and launched us forward. Popsicle Dude still had a hold of my buddy's arm and was trying to pull him out of the truck. He was running alongside the truck while the other guys in the cab held on to my buddy to keep him inside. After several moments, my buddy tore free from this guy and we hauled ass to the guard shack another 30 miles down the road. We checked in with the guards and reported what we had just seen. The guard was looking at us like we were pulling a prank, but policy said they had to check it out regardless. My buddy's arm was sore and when he pulled back his sleeve, there were noticeable bruises in the shape of a hand around his arm. We filed a report with the guard and were told to head back to our camp. None of us really wanted to talk about what happened and it was a quiet drive the rest of the way. We flew home the next day. The next time we saw the guard at the shack, we asked him if they ever saw Mr. Popsicle on his patrols. He told us they searched up and down that ice road for a solid 12 hour shift and saw nothing, not even tracks in the snow leading off the road. He told us it was a good prank and that he'd get us back for making him waste a shift driving around. But it wasn't a prank. Who would make up a story like that? And who would be willing to bruise their arm for a dumb prank? We never got a satisfying answer to what happened that evening. I still wonder about that dude, if he even was a dude. The Alaskan tundra is a weird place, and that was just one of my many weird stories from my time up there.
Weird things happen in the Appalachian Mountains. Their oldest time itself, and people who have lived there will be the first to tell you that it can be otherworldly, and sometimes you just have to turn a blind eye for our own sanity. I grew up in a small town outside Pisgah National Forest. Lots of waterfalls, great hikes, beautiful views. It's an amazing place to be, especially in summer. But what happened to me was in the dead of winter, when I was 17. Before I write all this, let me preface this by saying that at the time, I had just gotten my very first prescription of glasses, and was still not used to keeping them on 24-7. But although my vision was blurry, I know something was there with me the day this happened. When I was 17, I decided to do my senior project on nature photography. What better place to take some photos than the forest, right? So I asked my mother if she'd drive me into Pisgah and let me take some pictures as we winded through the woods. It was winter so the trees were bare and the sky was grey. It was still a fairly pretty day and I just wanted some pictures of the local flora. So my mom pulls over to let me walk down a trail I had been to hundreds of times. After a short little walk through the woods, you end up on the river bank. And the way the bank curved, you could walk along the little stony shore a little ways past the trail. Mind you, I was wearing a bright orange raincoat, so I was incredibly visible. So I'm crouching down to take a picture of a cool old ass railroad spike that had been sticking out of the earth for years. And all of a sudden, I realize there's no noise. Like scarily silent. No birds chirping. No nature sounds. Nothing. It's like I didn't even hear the sound of the water flowing. As this is happening, I suddenly realize exactly how visible and vulnerable I am. If you've ever experienced that primal sort of fear, you know what I mean. It was like alarm bells went off in my head going, danger, danger. As I'm sitting there with this feeling washing over me, I start to hear crunching footsteps. Again, the trees were bare, so there wasn't any foliage to block any view. I hear footsteps that sound like two feet getting closer and closer to the river from the opposite side of the bank, and I'm watching very closely. I couldn't move. Whatever I saw was all grey, and not human, but tall and appeared to be on two legs. It was getting closer and closer, and right as it was about to reach the river bank, I snapped out of my trance and turned and hightailed it. I have never been more scared or run that fast in my life. I booked it back to my mom's car and was obviously out of breath, so she asked me what happened. After I explained to her, she looked very worried and said that while I had been down the trail, she got this weird sudden fear that something was wrong and was about to come find me when I ran back. We left after that, and to this day, sometimes we will talk about it but with no real explanation. I told my boyfriend this story, and he insists it could have been a skinwalker. I have no idea what it was, and although I wish I had gotten a better look, I'm glad I ran away when I did. My girlfriend and I were graduate students living together in a six-unit apartment building with an outside stairwell. It was an older Victorian home that had been converted into apartments. The whole street was lined with similar buildings. It was off campus but conveniently located within walking distance of bars, a coffee shop and several restaurants. The neighborhood had a laid back bohemian vibe. The tenants were a mixture of college students, young professionals and families. The area was generally safe, but it wasn't too far from a rougher section of town. It was a Thursday night and being the night owl that I am, it was past 3 am and I had just finished a movie. I turned the TV off and went to the stairwell for a quick smoke before bed. We were in the middle of a snowstorm. The ground was covered in 6 inches of fresh powder and it was freezing cold. I quickly smoked my cigarette and rushed back inside. My girlfriend was always complaining about me forgetting to lock the door and as was my habit, I left the door unlocked. I jumped into bed and just as I was falling asleep, I thought I heard a noise. I brushed it off at first but then I heard a creak, probably just the wind, and concluded. Moments later, I heard the floorboards creaking. Now, I was listening intently. My girlfriend felt me shuffling and asked what was wrong. I told her I thought I heard something. 
Then we both heard what sounded like someone stumbling into our couch. We shot up and I yelled, Is someone there? No answer. The floor creaked again. This time in unison we shouted, Who's there? Another noise. I quietly stood up and scanned the room for something that could be used as a weapon. But nothing was there. Growing up, my dad always kept a baseball bat under his bed, and I regretted not adopting this practice. We yelled again, but there was no response again, but this time, from the darkness, we were greeted by a low-pitched, incomprehensible growl. I wondered if one of my buddies was playing a prank on me. That seemed out of character for my friends, especially at this hour on a weekday night and during a snowstorm. What I really thought was that a crackhead had wandered in. My girlfriend yelled, Who's out there? More footsteps. The intruder was still in the family room, but he was getting closer to our bedroom. We heard the growl again, but this time it was followed by a gurgle. It's... It's Matt. We didn't know any Matts. At least not any that would enter our apartment uninvited in the middle of the night. I looked at my girlfriend. I'd never seen someone so scared. If worse came to worse, I thought to myself, I know I can outrun this bitch. I hope it didn't come to that. Mad who? We shouted repeatedly. After a long pause, he finally said, Matt, uh, I'm friends with Mike and Kelly. Relief washed over both of us. Mike and Kelly were our neighbors. I turned on the lights and walked into the family room, and there he stood a six foot two junky looking college kid. Matt was blacked out drunk. Our neighbors had hosted a pregame party at their apartment followed by a trip to the nearby bars. They had abandoned Matt and despite the storm, he had found his way back to their apartment. Their door was locked and his phone calls had gone unanswered. His evolutionary drive to survive had kicked in and he had sought warmth in the first unlocked apartment he could find. I told him that he scared the shit out of us and that he had to go. He stepped outside and I quickly locked the door behind him. The next day I learned that Matt froze to death. He'd been discovered by another neighbor huddled next to her car under the lean-to garage. Before I begin, I'm going to say that I'm a 19-year-old man and working a full-time job. I have since moved out of the place that this incident occurred in. What happened took place when I was about 6 years old. I lived in a decent neighborhood. We did have the occasional creepy person that would walk by or bike by. We also had some apartment buildings where the people living there were heavy into drugs. I didn't bother anyone. There were nice people to talk to and frequently mentioned they were into that stuff. They never bothered me so I didn't care. Now enough with the background. The house I lived in at that point was a very decent size. My dad also built a garage, a huge garage. Now this is what happened. The garage was huge, it had enough space for three vehicles and rafters on the ceiling for storage of seasonal stuff, like Halloween or Christmas decorations. This took place in December. I live in Atlantic Canada, and in Atlantic Canada, we get some pretty nasty snowstorms and blizzards. On a day in December, I was being a little kid in the snow and my dad was working the garage on one of his car projects. He had gotten thirsty and went into the house to get a drink. He came back out and asked if I had gone into the garage. I asked why and he said there's footprints in the snow leading into the garage that he didn't think were his. I said no and we both thought nothing of it. That evening, my dad and I went to bed early. My mom works late and came home late that night and saw one of my toys that were in the rafters stored away on the garage floor. She thought nothing of it, moved them and parked the vehicle in the garage, closed the garage door and went into the house and watched some TV and went to bed. Now my dad wakes up at 4am every morning to go to work at 5am. The garage door was opened when my dad woke up, so naturally he was angry. He wakes up everyone and goes out to the garage, comes back in and is freaking out about a lot of very expensive equipment missing. We call the cops. The outside lights flicked on and we saw those same mysterious footprints leading to the garage earlier, leading into the backyard and into the forestry behind my house. 
The cops searched the garage and my mom brought up the toys falling from the rafters. The cops asked to borrow a ladder and went up to check. They found a gun, a meat cleaver, three condoms, two of which were used, and assuming he pleasured into them. I did not sleep for a week. I was terrified. They caught the guy two weeks later trying to sell all of my dad's equipment at a pawn shop. He confessed to everything. He said he broke into other houses on our street. He also stated he watched our house for a whole month to learn all of our routines so he wouldn't get caught. He had the weapons in case he did. He said he pleasured into the condoms when he saw my mom. He is currently serving a 15 year prison sentence. I don't want to know what could have happened if my mom, dad or I had seen him.